Many of you have heard me say before that strong citizens build strong communities. But this doesn't just happen overnight. The right conditions, capacity, collaboration, communication, and cohesion must be healthy and vibrant to stimulate a community identity that's forward-leaning, self-sustained, engaged, and resilient. These core beliefs are the foundation of the Greater Clark Foundation's investment strategy, and the Harwood Institute for Public Innovation shares these core beliefs. We're delighted to have them as a community partner to help our community grow stronger by building from within. And with that, I am delighted to introduce our main attraction for the evening. Many of you met Rich Harwood when he joined us here at Ambition Fest in 2017. Rich is the president and founder of the Harwood Institute for Public Innovation. He has devoted his career to revitalizing the nation's hardest hit communities, transforming the world's largest organizations, and reconnecting institutions like newsrooms and schools to society. Over the past 30 years, Rich has developed a new philosophy and practice of how communities can solve shared problems, create shared responsibility, and deepen civic faith. The Harwood practice of turning outward has spread to all 50 US states and is being used in 40 countries. His experience working on the ground to build capacity and coalitions for change gives him a unique and powerful insight on bridging divides and creating resilient communities. In Newtown, Connecticut, after the massacre at Sandy Hook Elementary School, Rich led the process for the community to collectively decide the fate of the school building. Today, Rich is spreading a vision for what it takes to create communities, lives, and an America that reflects the best in us and the best of us. In his newest book, Stepping Forward, an Amazon bestseller that could possibly mention Clark County, by the way, Rich provides a new and inspiring footprint to rediscover what we share in common and build upon it. I am excited today to be joined by Rich Harwood to learn more about how we can each step forward and get on a positive, practical path to transform our communities and our lives. Please join me in welcoming him back to Clark County, my dear friend, Rich Harwood. When I was here a few years ago and we released Raiding the Community's Plan, the first thing I said when I stood up was that I wasn't going to sugarcoat what we had found. Right? I wasn't going to sugarcoat what we had found. We had found a community that was wracked by an opioid and meth crisis. We had found a community where many kids in your community went to blue ribbon schools but felt abandoned by other adults here. We found a community that was divided by race and income and geography and religious beliefs and theology. We found a community where your downtown was stalled and people said it was a symbol of what wasn't happening. We found a town where people said that things got started but they never got finished. We found a town where people said that their voices were not heard and in fact they did not feel seen and heard and visible to one another. Remember that? And I said at that moment you had a choice. You could wallow in despair or you could step forward and make something of what you had that you could see the glass as half empty or half full, and that I believed it was half full, and that you had many good assets to build upon, and that you needed to get to work. And I'm here to report three years later. I'm here to celebrate with you three years later that there has been amazing progress in Winchester and Clark County, and I hope to God that you're proud of it. I hope to God that you're proud of it that I can tell you that in my 30 years of doing this work, I have not seen a community make this much progress starting where you started three years ago and where you are today. And I can tell you the reason why this is so important, not just for Clark County, but for America. We live, as you know, in divided times. We are polarized as a people. We are at each other's throats all too often. Too many of us are hunkered down and have retreated from one another and have turned our backs on one another and are pointing fingers at one another. And it seems to me that we have a choice. Will we accept what's happening in our country or not? 
And I'm here to say tonight as clearly and as forcefully as I possibly can, we do not need to accept what's happening in our country today. That we can do better, that we can be better. That we have an opportunity to bring out the best in ourselves, the best of ourselves. But to do it, to do it, each of us in this room are going to have to step forward and demonstrate the best in ourselves and the best of ourselves. And I believe we have the power to do that within ourselves, within each of us, to step forward and bring forward the best in ourselves. And not only that, but to take on what I believe is the greatest challenge in America today. There are lots of issues that I'm going to talk about that are important. But I believe the greatest issue this country faces is whether or not we will believe in ourselves and in one another that we can come together and get things done. And here's the thing. Here's the thing why I'm so proud and happy to be here in Winchester and Clark County tonight. You're demonstrating that it's possible in a country that is polarized for people to come together. And the work that you're doing is important, yes, for Winchester and Clark County. And it's also important for the state of Kentucky, for other communities to see and hear and find out about. But here's the thing. We need you as Americans to succeed here. Because what you're demonstrating here is an example that the rest of us in the rest of the country need to see and need to heed and need to follow. We need to follow Winchester and Clark County. You with me? You with me? And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Now, I know as much progress as you've made over the last two or three years that this is still a struggle. There are still too many kids who are being left out and left behind. There are too many people still trying to recover from drug addiction. There are too many people facing the scourge of racism. And I know something about struggle, personal struggle myself. And I know something about the power of possibility. And I know something about the power of community. You see, when I was born, I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. In the early 1960s, that was a death sentence. It was a death sentence. No one expected me to make it this far, and no one expected me surely to be here in Leeds Theater being able to talk to you tonight. There was a point at which the doctors turned to my mom and said, face it, he's a lemon. I grew up most of my childhood and a good part of my early adulthood in hospital beds. And I have vivid memories of all the doctors, nurses, and specialists all surrounding my bed talking about me, but never talking to me. I travel for a living now. Every week I'm on the road, just like I went here today. And when I went to the Hampton Inn and took my little plastic card and put it up against the lock, and open that door, to this day, I don't see a hotel room, I still see a hospital room. It wasn't until just a number of years ago that when I slept in hotel rooms every week, I didn't sleep with every light turned on, and I didn't sleep through the night with my clothes on. But here's the thing, I was lucky. Somewhere along the way, my diagnosis changed, but way before that, I was fortunate. I had a basketball coach named Mr. Rivers was a laborer at our local racetrack. And he taught me that despite my illness and my own anxieties, that I could exert myself physically, and it was OK to have hope. There was a gentleman down the street named Mr. Petker, who belonged to the same synagogue that my family helped to start in our small town in upstate New York. He was an engineer in town. And on weekends, he'd pick me up to take, take me on errands, and we'd go to our local synagogue to fix electrical problems. And he'd make me climb the ladder up into the ceiling, and I remember my legs still shaking with my fear of heights. And looking back now, as hokey as it sounds, what I realized is he was helping me reach up into my potential and realize that I could climb higher in my life. I had a next door neighbor named Jack Brundage who worked at the assembly plant boxing Cheerios for General Mill cereals. And he had a wood shop in his backyard. And he used to take me back into his wood shop and teach me how to build things with my hands. And I realized that I could make things. I could be a creator. I could produce things. Over and over again, I learned that these three men, 
like so many of you, ensured that I didn't fall through the cracks and they lifted me up and made sure that I made it into life. But here's the thing. I will never forget what it feels like to be invisible. I will never forget what it feels like to not be seen and heard. I will never forget what it feels like to have your dignity stripped from you. I will never forget what it feels like to know that tomorrow will not be better than today. It will be worse. Today, I think Americans, and I think many people here in Clark County and Winchester, are wrestling with the same issues that I wrestled with as a child and as a young adult. I think people in our country and in this community and in waving the community flag told us they want to know, will we afford every person in this community dignity or will we just talk about it? Will we see, every, see and hear every individual in this community or just some of us? Dignity to me is not like respect, which is what you earn over time. Dignity is a birthright. It's a God-given right. It's non-negotiable. And yet we talk about dignity, but I often wonder whether or not we're going to afford it to every single individual here in Clark County. And I think there are lots of people in this county who wonder the same thing. It seems to me dignity has to be afforded regardless of the color of your skin, regardless what side of town you are on, regardless of how much money you earn, regardless of what kind of car you drive. It's non-negotiable. Hope. I think people want to know, will they have hope in their lives right here in Clark County? Hope to me is not a campaign slogan. It's not a bumper sticker. It's not something a politician talks about, though lots of politicians like to talk about it. It's not um, some abstract idea either. Hope to me is a really basic definition. Does a single mom who's sending her two kids to school, does she have hope that her kids will go to a school that will support them? Does she have hope that her kids, when they're growing up, can achieve the American dream or at least have a shot at it? She wants to know whether or not her two kids will have a shot at fulfilling their God-given potential. And her two kids, when they're going to bed at night, like all of us did when we were all much younger, when we're putting our head down on our pillow, remember that every night? Those two kids, when they're starting to fall asleep and they're closing their eyes, they want to know, will tomorrow be better than today? I think we face a fundamental human challenge in our society. There are lots of technical challenges. But will we give people dignity? And will they have real hope? And the last part is community. Community. Will everyone in our community here in Winchester and Clark County be part of our community? Or is community just for some of us? Is it just for some of us? There are too many people, as you know, in this community who are being left out and left behind. Still, notwithstanding your valiant efforts over the last three years and even before then. And the question for us is, will we make community truly a common enterprise? Or will community just be for some of us? Will community just be for some of us? Now, when I go around the country talking, which I've been doing for the last few months when my book came out, I always give examples of a community that actually is succeeding at helping people find dignity, hope, and community. I've been to Sacramento, California, and Paradise, California, which was, as you know, leveled by the campfire. I've been to Greenville, South Carolina. I've been to Des Moines. I've been all over our country. And I just came here to tell you that the community I use as the best example I've got right now in America is Winchester and Clark County. I know, I know people want to talk about communities on the coast, not a community in Kentucky. But I still think you're the best example I've seen of a community moving forward at a time of polarization and division. I'm just going to repeat some stories. You all know these stories better than I do. But they're worth telling, again, because, well, we can't tell positive, productive stories too many times in our communities today, right? Your why closed. 400 kids out of playing basketball, right? Mike McCormick and other pastors in this town 
had been praying about, as I understand it, about gun shootings that are taking place across our country and in Kentucky, about the racial divisions that are happening here in this town, about the fact that people from different sides of town don't get together, about too many kids feel abandoned. And so Mike decided, not on his own, but with five other churches, as I understand it, to come together and create Upward Sports. Sports was the excuse to bring kids together, as I understand it. This was really about building character. It was about demonstrating to each child that they are of value and in God's image. It was of demonstrating that we could marshal our collective resources in this community to surround our children and lift them up, just like those three men in my community lifted me up when I was a kid. And so when Upward Sports began, they didn't have 400 kids. No, they had 860 kids. Their second year, they had over 900 kids. And lo and behold, before they knew it, they were running out of gymnasium space and other spaces. And so Jeff Gaines, as I understand it, stepped forward and said, I've got a gym, but it's in disrepair, correct? It's going to cost me upwards of what, twenty-eight, thirty, maybe $40,000 to fix when you're all done. You had some of the money, but not all the money. So another pastor in town raised their hand and said, I can't believe I'm going to do this, but I'm going to pass the plate to raise some money for Jeff's church. And then other pastors did the same thing, and they helped close the financial gap so you could get your floor repaired, if I understand it correctly. And now, as Mike just said in the tape, it's not five or six churches, it's ten. And it's not just churches, right? There's lots of other groups in town pitching in, doing the right thing. The thing about this is the people that we least expect to come together, come together in combinations we'd never expect and take actions we never could have imagined. But there's more here in Clark County and Winchester. There's Juanita Everman, who you saw on the tape, and Amanda Fields Hall, right? Two women in recovery. They go to one of the local churches. They end up going to a conference in Louisville on recovery. They get the idea that people who are overdosing on drugs need a more empathetic, sympathetic ear when they're brought into the hospital or to a doctor's office, correct? And so they design a program to do this. And not only did they design a program to do this, they trained 16 peer counselors, people in recovery themselves, people who we often would not afford any dignity to, but are, who are now taking the lead to help people rise up in their lives and make a better life for themselves. And not only that, but then they realize that when people have this first notion of treatment, treatment, as you know, can go on for years. And people need support and love and caring. And so they opened, as you saw on the tape, a storefront where they're offering classes to people in recovery and supporting them and ensuring that they move through treatment. The people we least expect and the combinations we least imagine are taking actions we could never have predicted. And then I have to talk about Leeds Theatre because we're here. And I'll probably get the story wrong, Tracy, so I apologize. But it's still going to be good. <laughs> but here you are in a community, and I'm not going to sugarcoat this either, a community with a history of slavery, a community with a history of racial divisions, a community where many would argue, and I would agree, of systemic racism still continuing. And what does Lee's Theater under Tracy's leadership do? She realizes that there's a plague called hairspray, right? Some people call it, as you recorded in our report, a bubblegum plague, a feel-good thing. But underneath the plague, underneath the script, as I understand it, are issues of race and racism. And so Tracy teamed up with Pastor King, correct? and said, let's do something about this, and not, let's not only put this production on, but let's have conversations after the play so that we can illuminate these tough issues and engage people in conversations about them and not sweep these issues under the table any longer. But you didn't stop there. You didn't stop there because you knew that there were so many people in this community who feel left out, 
whose dignity has been compromised or betrayed, gay and straight women and men, people who have been bullied, people who are recovering from addiction, right, over and over again. And so what happens? You team up these individuals with a playwright, as I understand it, to create the play outside our door. And you cast in it local folks to be the cast. And through their voices, the people who are depicted in that play and other people in this community who have similar lived experiences could begin to see and hear themselves, could begin to see their voices and their stories recognized. And it began a larger conversation that's now rippling throughout this community. That's courageous action. That's brave action for someone to take, for this lead theater to take, and for your partners to take, and for this community to take. But the ripple effects go way beyond these. There's Better Together Winchester, which as Jen said, is holding a forum next Tuesday on race, right? That held the candidates forum during the last election. There's Win that's doing fantastic work in engaging people in this community. There's the, the mindfulness program that started here and was designed here and has spread in your community, has spread to other school districts, and is gonna be a national model for, for this whole region. On and on and on the stories go. The people you'd least expect step forward in combinations we could not have imagined, taking actions we never could have predicted. And just tonight, I heard of more actions and other actions that are happening after we printed this damn report. <laughs> I'd tell you to stop, except it's too good a story to be true. <clears throat> and so I just want to talk for a few minutes, if I can, about what I think you're going to need to do to keep this momentum going. Because you're on to something important. And as I said before, it's not only for Winchester and Clark County and for the state of Kentucky. I just want to emphasize this point over and over again. America needs you right now. We need you. We need you. So four quick things that I want to mention. Things you're already doing, but I just want to underscore them. Number one is this. The change we need in our country today is going to happen in our local communities because that's where we can restore our belief in ourselves and in one another that we can come together and get things done. I live in Washington, D.C. I can tell you there's nothing productive that's going to happen there anytime soon. <laughs> And even if it did, it still couldn't restore the belief that we need to restore right here in Winchester and Clark County. Because it's right here in our local communities where we can turn outward toward one another. It's right here in Winchester and Clark County where we can begin to see and hear one another again. It's right here in Winchester and Clark County that we can afford one another dignity that no program from Washington, D.C. alone can do for us. Because it's a human task not a policy task. It's right here in Winchester and Clark County that we can demonstrate that we have the wherewithal, the know-how, the wisdom, the courage to step forward and create change in our own lives and shape our own futures and gain a greater sense of control over our lives moving forward, which I think so many of us desperately want right now. So that's number one. What you're doing in this local community is not waiting for Washington. Washington's waiting for you to demonstrate what it means to take action that's effective and productive and meaningful in people's lives. We need you. Number two, we've got to see ourselves as doers, as doers. There are so many of us, and so many of you have said to me tonight when I met you before, still here in Winchester and Clark County, there are so many of us who are still hunkered down. There are so many of us who are still retreated from one another. Frankly, there are so many of us waiting for someone to come save us. We're the ones we're waiting for. We're right here. We're right here. So many of you in this room are doing it. But we've got to see ourselves as doers again, as creators again, as partners in creating our communities. The pastors who created Upward Sports Yes, I know tending to your flock and your churches is important, but you're now tending to an entire community that's as important. They're doers. Juanita and Amanda, who started achieving 
recovery together. They could have stayed on the sidelines. They could have watched things happen. They could have watched things happen to them. And instead, they stepped forward and stood up and created the change you needed in this community. They're examples of doers. Leeds Theater, when they brought Hairspray in and had the courage to hold these conversations or outside our door and put on that play, was a different form of doing and of believing. We each need to be doers in our communities. And here's the thing. I think this is just who we are as Americans. We've just saw, somehow forgotten it for a moment. We're waiting for the next great plan to come. We're waiting for the next great experts to come into our community. We're waiting for all this money to flow in. Well, let's get to work while we're waiting. Because when we get to work, we're actually creating a new community already. We're already creating a new community. Third, you still with me? You sure? Yes. All right. Thought maybe I was here by myself. Third, we've got to take back our shared story. We've got to take back our shared story. When I came to Winchester and Clark County three years ago, this was the story I heard from people. Change is never going to come here. We've got to look back to our bygone days and figure out how we can reclaim them. Except, as many of you know, your bygone days weren't so great for a whole lot of folks. Right? Yes. Weren't so great for a whole lot of folks. The story in Winchester and Clark County is starting to change now. It's not that we're looking backwards to reclaim something we may not even want anymore. It's that we're creating a future that we do want, and that we do want to create together, and that we do want to reflect the best in, of, the best in us and the best of us. These narratives, these shared stories that I'm talking about, that we tell each other, heck, we don't even know that we tell each other these stories. But these ingrained narratives, they shape our mindset, they shape our attitudes, they shape our behaviors and actions, they shape how we talk to one another. And in Winchester and Clark County, one of the tasks moving forward is how do you reclaim your shared story of a productive can-do narrative that says we can move forward together. We can bridge our divides. We can bring people together. We can overcome drug addiction. We can do it here, right here in Winchester and Clark County, and we don't need to wait for others to come save us. We can do it ourselves. But to do this, here's the thing. To do this, you're going to have to claim your new story. Someone said to me tonight, before coming in, they said, I didn't even realize I was creating all that change. And that's something I hear in a lot of communities. That's why we created this tool called Making the Invisible Visible. Because we've got to make visible to ourselves those things that are often invisible, where we are creating progress, where we think we're just sort of going in place. But with challenges as large as we face in our country and you face here in this community, every step forward, as Jen said earlier, is meaningful, it's important, and it gets us going in the right direction. We in this room have to claim the stories of change, the one step at a time that we're making. We have to illuminate these stories. We have to tell them to one another. We have to repeat them time and time again. And when we do, so long as, sorry, I'm going to say this, Dan, so long as we stay away from public relations and, and campaigns. I know that's not what you do. But these stories have to be authentic. They have to emerge out of the community from the hard work that we're doing together, being creators together, being doers together. And we have to tell them over and over again. And these stories are important, not just for ourselves, but for others. Because when we spread these stories, they're like parables. They begin, they begin to create in people a sense of belief that something positive is happening. And these stories implicate others because they can begin to see that they could be part of them. There's an old country song. I'm from the South. I'm from South New York, Brooklyn. <laughs> so I know about the South, but look. <laughs> I know you distinguish yourself from the Deep South. But there is an old country song, the refrain of which is, I can't see me in your eyes anymore. 
And I think more than anything, people want to see themselves and hear themselves and know that their lives are valued. And I think the stories we tell one another about the progress we're making allows people to see and hear themselves and imagine themselves as doers and creators and partners in this common enterprise called community. And so that's point three. We've got to tell these stories and reclaim our shared story. Third, fourth, last. We've got to focus on what matters to people. If we don't do this, there's nothing else that I said tonight that matters. Nothing else. When I came to Winchester and Clark County, what I heard was people saying, we've just focused on our problems. We focus on those things that haven't been solved. And then we create these grand plans to solve them, but nothing happens. And you and I both know that when we, when we focus just on our problems, people want to know why those problems haven't been solved. Then they want to know who is responsible for solving them. And then they want to know who the heck they can blame because they're not solved. Well, that just takes us down the toxic road of discourse that we've been stuck in in this country and community for too long. When we build these great big visionary plans, these utopian visions, I think you know this, but we Americans, we're not into utopia. We're pragmatists. We like to get stuff done. And these utopian visions, they don't relate to our real lives. And so here's an alternative that many of you have already been doing here in Winchester and Clark County that I just want to underscore. You're way ahead of me on this. And that is we need to make a commitment, a common shared commitment in this room that we're going to focus on what matters to people and we're going to do it by focusing on their shared aspirations. On their shared aspirations. Because here's the thing. When people start to focus on their shared aspirations, they begin to realize that while we may have differences, why our skin color may be different, why our heritage and history may be different, why our economic status may be different, why where we live may be different, that there is still stuff that brings us together that we hold in common that can overcome what divides us. And that when we focus on what we share in common, we can actually get to work on that as opposed to waiting to agree on everything. When we focus on our shared aspirations, we begin to recognize that no one leader, sorry leaders, no one organization, no one foundation, no one church, no one anything can do this work here on earth by themselves. That we need one another. That we need a community as a common enterprise. That we can't go it alone on our own to achieve our shared aspirations. But here's the thing, if you want to commit to focusing on our shared aspirations, then it means that we're going to have to make a commitment, a solemn commitment, to engage people who look different than ourselves, who sound different than ourselves, who are different from ourselves. And are we prepared to do that? Because in our lives and in this country, we tend to talk to people who look like us, sound like us, and do the same things as us. And if we want to bridge divides, if we want to make sure every kid in this community doesn't feel betrayed and abandoned but has love, if we want to assure that we can cross divisions on religious beliefs, then we're going to have to talk to folks who are different than ourselves. The other thing is, if we want to focus on our shared aspirations, we need to be prepared to hear people's anger, to hear their frustration, to hear their sorrow, sometimes to hear their rage. We're going to have to be willing to focus on loss because people have lost things in their lives. And so that requires that we need to have the courage and the humility to stand in the space with one another and hear each other speak about our lived experiences and stay in that space long enough to begin to understand one another, to have empathy for one another, to reach across the divisions and start to work together with one another. A couple last things and I'll close. There are some people in the country, maybe right here in Winchester and Clark County, when I talk about these things, who say, Rich, this might have happened in America from your childhood, but it can't happen in today's America. We are too polarized, we are too divided. We are too retreated, we are too hunkered down. And I have a really common response to all of them. 
Before this country was founded, when the 13 colonies existed, the 13 colonies, as you know, held very little in common with one another, except they wanted to get rid of King George the tyrant. And so colonists from across the 13 colonies came off their farms, came out of small towns, without fax machines and an internet, without any of that. They banded together and created the American Revolution and created what I believe is still the best and the most exceptional country on the face of this earth. When we faced slavery in this country, we came together as Americans and abolished it. We created women's suffrage in this country. We created voting rights and civil rights and, and seatbelt laws. And you know what? Every single example and 20 others I could give you, do you know where they all started? Not in Washington, D.C. Not even in our state capitals. They started in communities like Winchester and Clark County. By Americans coming together and saying we can do better, that we can be better. By Americans coming together that we are the best and most exceptional country in the world, except we have stains on our civic fabric that we need to deal with and deal with forthrightly and directly and overcome together. We have done it over and over and over again, and my message to you is now it's our turn. It's our turn right here in Clark County and Winchester to take on the next set of challenges, which I believe is to restore our belief in ourselves and one another that we can still do it, that we can still be a, co a country with great promise. And so let me just close with one last thought, one last story. When I was a child laying in those hospital beds, I learned firsthand what it's like to not have dignity, hope, or feel part of a community. As I said before, I will never, ever forget those feelings. When the Newtown massacre occurred, I saw that happen at a community level in the most extreme example. Just a few weeks after that massacre, where 20 first graders were killed and six adults were gunned down, as you remember, I got a call from the mayor of Newtown asking me whether or not I would come there and help the community move forward and figure out how they would move forward. And I realized pretty quick that while this was a decision about a school building, it was really a question about whether or not a community that had suffered trauma and despair could pivot to healing and hope. And the mayor set up a task force from four governing boards of 24, 28 elected officials, if you can imagine this, none of whom liked each other on their own governing boards, and certainly none of whom really liked each other across those governing boards. And this was the group I was going to lead. Every meeting we held was in public. It was covered by CNN, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. Everything was in public. Banks of television cameras and radio stations. And as we were working through these decisions, we finally came to a point where we thought we were going to make a decision. And the Wall Street Journal that morning ran an article saying, Newtown Task Force ready to make a decision on the future of the school. Except as I was reading that article, I got a phone call from the mayor's office saying that 30 school teachers from Sandy Hook Elementary School released a public letter. And they said that under no conditions would they ever go back to that school. Under no conditions would they ever go back to that school. And so when I flew up from Washington, D.C., where I lived, to Hartford and then drove 45 minutes to Newtown and got there for what was supposed to be our final decision-making meeting, there were hundreds of townspeople who had crammed into that room to see the final decision. There were scores of television cameras and journalists there going to cover this. And my first act that night was to stand up and say, I'm sorry, you all have to leave the room tonight because we're going to bring these 30 teachers into the room to talk to the task force. This was our only private meeting that we would hold in this entire process. And in this room were 30 te teachers, the 24 task force members, two mental health workers, and myself. And that night, which I'll never forget, I heard harrowing stories of teachers who talked about the gunman coming down the hall shooting off his rifles, of hiding their kids in storerooms, of hiding their kids in bathroom stalls, in hiding their kids underneath desks, 
of barricading their doors so no one could get into their classroom, of watching their fellow teachers get gunned down in the hallway and they could do nothing about it. And so when we finished that conversation after a couple of hours and went back into the chamber where we were holding the room, the meeting, and all the television cameras came back in and the hundreds of townspeople, my second act, public act that night, was to stand up and say, as much as we'd like to make a decision, we can't make a decision tonight. It's too emotional a situation. It's not the right time to make a decision. And so I sent the task force away, thinking, saying to them, we'll come back, hopefully, in another meeting or two, and try to figure out what to do. And I'll forget this, when we brought them back after a two-week period, and I asked them what they were thinking about. There was a woman named Laura on the task force who said, what I've come to realize is there is no perfect solution for an imperfect situation. We just need to move forward as best we can. We just need to move forward as best we can. But over the next three hours, this task force split into three groups. It looked like the process would fall apart. It looked like there would be divisions and polarization. It looked like people would point fingers at one another. It looked like people would cast aspersions at one another. It looked like this community wouldn't be able to pivot from trauma and despair to healing and hope. Sound familiar? And yet, over those three hours, those task force members came together. And they worked out their differences. And they gave a little. And they compromised some. And they heard one another and they reach across their divisions. And not only did they make a decision that night, they made, and not only was it a split decision, they made a unanimous decision that night to tear down that school and build anew. In Newtown, Connecticut, in unimaginable circumstances, those folks came together and held their community together. My question for us in Winchester and Clark County my question for us as Americans is it's our turn. Will we come together and hold our country together? Will we come together and hold our communities together? The work that you're doing here and the progress that you've made over the last three years is truly remarkable. It's important for your community and this county. It's important for the state of Kentucky. But I'm also here to tell you it's important for the rest of America. We need you. So please keep on continuing the great work that you're doing. Keep on making progress and keep taking one step at a time forward. Thanks so much for having me. We have, we have time for some Q&A. Um, I was just hoping you could talk a little bit more about continuing the momentum. You talked a little bit generally, but specifically in Clark County, what do you think we should be doing? So first of all, the efforts that so many of you are making, whether it's Better Together Winchester or WIN um, or the mindfulness program, or there's a whole bunch of pockets of things that are all documented in this report. Um, it's really important to keep them going. One of the mistakes that often happens when a community reaches the point that you're at. So in the report, we talk about these stages of community life. And when we started working here, you were in the, what we would call the waiting place, and you're now in early catalytic. It's remarkable progress in less than three years. I don't see very many communities make it. Here's the challenge. Most communities stop. They begin to think that they've solved their problems. They begin to think they know what needs to be done. They begin to think they know what matters to people. They begin to think that they've got enough, if you want to call them innovators or change agents, or I just call them folks, um, who want to step forward and make good things happen. And so first and foremost, what I'd say is, those of you who are already engaged in different efforts, you need to keep them going so long as they're relevant to the community. When they're no longer relevant, stop. Do something else, right? So that's number one. Number two, um, I think you've got to keep, you know, one of the great things that's documented in this report is the crossover from different folks in different groups working together in different ways. There's a cross-fertilization. That's really important because that's weaving the civic fabric of your community, so you're not so siloed. Most communities don't do that. You're doing it naturally here. It's partly a, a, a function of your size also, which is a great thing. 
And so I think the question is, how do you keep bringing pe people in from other, other pockets so that you can begin to cross-fertilize what you're doing and learn from one another? Um, a third thing I would say, whether it's through the foundation or through Leeds Theater, sorry, Tracy, or some other group, or Better Together Winchester, whatever, it doesn't matter which group it is, you need to keep convening yourselves as change agents. There's power in numbers. There's also comfort in numbers. There's support in numbers. And so what you really want to do is you want to keep convening and bringing yourselves together because you need allies. I don't need to tell you this, but I'll say it anyway. This work is hard. There are lots of people who are going to encamp against you. There are lots of people who are going to tell you you can't be done. There are lots of people who are going to tell you you're taking on the wrong issues. There are lots of people telling you you're taking on taboo issues. I'm sure some of you have heard that. You need allies. You need people who can stand next to you. And even when they disagree with you on the specific issue you're working on, they can vouch for you that you're a good person, you're motivated by the right things, and you're doing your best. And that's the third thing I would say. So those are three quick things that are really important. None of those require money, by the way. Sorry, Jen, I know you like to give out money. But none of, <laughs> none of those things require money. There are things that do require money, but a lot of things we need to do right now don't require a whole lot of money. Rich, you said there's been a lot of change here. What would you say, from, from what you've seen and heard, has been the most significant change in this amount of time in Winchester? Uh, belief. Belief. I mean, because I could point to like the, I mean, uh, the, some of the work that Main Street Winchester has done, which I haven't mentioned, is really fantastic. Code enforcement, other things I know were really important in waving the community's flag because they sent signals to people about whether or not they should come downtown. This downtown, by the way, looks fundamentally different than three years ago when I first visited. It's, un it's, 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 unbel it's, it's unbelievable. But I would say the most important thing is belief. When you hear people say that we can actually get things done, when you hear people say we can have a form and people will show up, when you say we can have a form and elected officials will show up, when you say that we can actually start to have conversations and people start to feel heard and seen, when you start to see that people in recovery believe that they have innate capacities and a human spark that they can put to work for other people and they can serve others, all of that stuff to me is about belief in ourselves and in one another. And I think communities move forward. Yes, we need resources. Yes, we need good plans. But without belief, we go nowhere. And I think, to me, that's one of the key ingredients right now. All right. Well, please join me in thanking Rich.